really good time. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, our family went on a road trip to Yellowstone National Park. Now, highly recommend it. Awesome, beautiful place. Uh, there's just incredible scenery there that you see. And now, if you go from here to out there and you were to drive straight without gas, without going to the bathroom, it's about a 20-hour drive, according to Google Maps. So we had a great time seeing sites like Badlands in South Dakota, Mount Rushmore, and then in the park, Old Faithful and these different things. But after sleeping in tents and being on the road, it was a great feeling, you know, 20 hours there, 20 hours back, that's a 40-hour trip. It was a great feeling to see this sign, Wisconsin welcomes you. And what that meant is that as you're driving in, after 40 hours of driving, this sign meant that we were finally entering our home state, and soon the 40-hour journey would be over. Well, we're beginning this new series in the book of Joshua in just a few weeks. The people of God, the Israelites, were journeying ever since God freed them from slavery in Egypt, even though the journey should have only lasted days to walk to the promised land, God actually made them wander around the wilderness for 40 years. I felt so good entering Wisconsin after a 40-hour journey. Imagine entering your promised homeland after 40 years. So today as we look at this passage, and we're not really going to look in-depth into this passage as much, but what we want to do is I just want to lay like a little bit of groundwork and some of it, much of it is going to be review of what we've talked about in Genesis and Exodus. So I'm pulling out some of those things again because those are foundational things in order for us to understand the book of Joshua. And we're going to study it in a few weeks later. Uh, next week we have the retreat and then a couple weeks after that there will be newcomers and stuff. So today I thought we had a good time before all these newcomers come, just to lay this sort of introduction uh, to the book of Joshua by looking at what's happened so far in Israel's story. Um, I was so uh, struggling this past year because uh, I, I really want to preach to the book of Romans. Uh, you know, they say that uh, one scholar once said that all books of the Bible lead to Romans, you know, and Romans is kind of like the pinnacle of the Bible. And so uh, to me, I feel like I'm still preparing to study Romans as a preacher. And so I think studying Joshua will be tremendously important for our church, but also helpful so that we understand the whole scope of redemptive history. If you want to understand Romans, you have to understand Israel, and you have to understand the Old Testament. Otherwise, you can have sort of a shallow understanding of that. So this is all building together as we see the whole of God's redemptive story and what's happening. So anyways, so three things we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about patriarchs of Genesis. Remember, we're looking back at redemptive history a little bit, just laying the foundation for our future study in Joshua. And then we're going to talk about the progression of Israel what happened in Israel, so we understand their story a little bit more, and just some thoughts as we prepare for the book of Joshua in a few weeks. Okay? I'm, I'm very excited to study this book, and so can't wait. I've got all these commentaries and books ready to go and ready to study it, so hope you'll read it the next few weeks, read it again and again, get familiar with it. We're going to study it in our family groups, so get familiar with Joshua uh, this, this year. So let's talk about patriarchs of Genesis. If you want to understand the book of Genesis and the flow of Israel's history and human history, actually, there are several key figures that we need to know about in the book of Genesis that really form the outline of the entire book. And so, of course, it begins with Adam. Adam, uh, in Genesis chapter 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so in Adam, what we see is this idea of God who is going to pursue. Remember, this is all re 
redeeming history, redemptive history. God is pursuing sinful humanity. As we know, Adam and Eve, they, they were created to experience God's presence freely. They walked around the garden, and they walked and talked with God freely. Can you imagine that? They had no clothes, but they had no shame. And so freely they lived, enjoying all of God's creation, enjoying God's presence. And presence is an important theme because presence of God in their life is what they lost when they fell into sin. When you look at the book of Romans, the book of Romans teaches that Adam was the first representative of humanity. So we inherit Adam's sinful DNA because he sinned, he made a choice to sin, he was a representative. So the moment we are conceived, we receive that sinful spiritual DNA and we are born as sinners. As we say all the time, we are not sinners because we sin, we sin because we are sinners. You know, some people feel like, man, God is like unfair by making me be represented by Adam. I didn't ask for that. I want to make my own choice. But actually, this system of representation is which is what allows grace to come forth later so that Christ can represent us through that same system. So in Adam, we see God. He is restoring his presence as he pursues sinful humanity. This is the beginning of it. This is the promise. Genesis 3.15 is the gospel first revealed. We call this proto-evangelion. It's the first gospel. This is the gospel where it begins when he says, I will send someone and he's going to crush the head of Satan. And that is Jesus that it's talking about. That's the first patriarch. Second patriarch in the book of Genesis is, of course, Abraham. God here is promising a people, promising a family. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, look at this, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God was selecting Abraham so that through his family, all the families of the earth could be blessed. He's got to start somewhere, so he begins with Abraham and this family family, this nation that's going to be formed. And so God is establishing a covenant promise with Abraham. Your children are going to become more numerous than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the sands on the seashore. We know, looking back, that it's not just just talking about ethnic Israel, but more numerous than stars, more numerous than sands on the seashore. It's talking about all those who become spiritual believers, spiritual members of this family. So this family, at least here, becoming the Israelites for now, is to be a light to all the other nations so that eventually the entire world will be blessed by having this presence of God with them. We know it's not just a nation family built on ethnicity, but it's built on faith. It's not about race, but it's about grace. So believers become family members through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are blood relatives through faith in Jesus Christ's blood. It's a spiritual nation through which this promise is fulfilled. So in Abraham, the story of Abraham is about God promising this family that will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. doesn't matter if you're whatever ethnicity, whatever country, whatever nation you're from, but this blessing was to go forth to all the nations. Third patriarch is Jacob. In Jacob, we see that God is now growing the family. So we can see this chart just to help visualize a little bit how God is growing the descendants and growing this family. Abraham had several wives, which led to many children. 
The Bible is not pro-polygamy, but that was the context and the culture of the time, and so the Bible speaks inside of that context. Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the chosen son through whom this redemptive promise would continue. And then you look at Jacob. Jacob has many sons, one of which is Joseph, who the book of Genesis will end with. We'll talk about him next. And Joseph has a dream in which his brothers are bowing down to him. This infuriates his brothers, and what happens is they plot to kill him. They do not end up killing him, and his brothers traffic him into slavery, and then Joseph ends up being sent out to Egypt through trafficking. And so that's what happens as the family expands and becomes this nation. So from one, from Abraham, it grows and it becomes this growing family, this growing nation. And then we see Joseph himself. Through Joseph, we see God moves the family. Genesis 50, verse 22, end of Genesis. So Joseph remained in Egypt. Remember, he got trafficked there. He and his father's house, Joseph, lived 110 years. So Joseph, who began as a slave in Egypt, because his brothers sold him into slavery, what happens is he interprets a dream, and then he's demonstrating excellence in his job, excellence in his work. And then he rises within the ranks of that situation, that corporate environment, that country, and he becomes second only to the king, to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. So he becomes the right-hand man of Pharaoh. He rose from a slave to that position because of his excellence. Famine has come upon Joseph's homeland where his family is in the land of Canaan. And so they need food. And so what do they do? They go and search for food. And so they come over to Egypt hoping to find food because there's famine, devastation in the land. And even through those kind of natural disasters, we see how God can be sovereignly working and orchestrating things for his good. And so what happens is the family encounters Joseph, who is now a big man in Egypt in control of all the grain and control of all the food. And he has the ability to provide food for his brothers who are coming from Egypt. When they come, Joseph, he sees and he remembers and he recognizes his brothers. But Joseph has changed, you know, before they threw him into a pit like an animal. But now he's probably well-dressed and he's prestigious in Egypt. And so they don't recognize him. And so Joseph doesn't reveal his identity right away. But he converses with them, and he makes this deal with them. But eventually, Joseph reveals his identity. Forgiveness flows, and the family is united as Joseph forgives them. So it's through Joseph that the family of Israel is allowed to come and live within Egypt, and they are given this land called Goshen that's within Egypt. So just think about that story a little bit. If you remember those names... Adam, Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. You almost have the whole book of Genesis right there. That's the whole flow of Genesis. And so this is the flow of God's redemptive story as he's building that through Genesis. So we saw those patriarchs. Now, what we have to do is we have to think about how this flows into the people of God in the story of Exodus, which we studied a couple of years ago. And so we're going to talk about the progression of Israel. What happens for Israel is, remember, they've come now to the land of Goshen. So in Exodus chapter 1, we'll just look at verse 5. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, big family. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all of his brothers in that generation. So when Joseph's family joins him in Egypt, 70 people, imagine you're having a wedding reception, you've got to have 70, 70 people's worth of tables there. It's a big group. So in this first section of Exodus, what we see is we see their names. Uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. These are all of Joseph's brothers. They're the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if you remember, there's a story where Jacob's name is changed from Jacob 
to Israel. And so this is the establishing of the people known as the Israelites, the Jewish people who exist even today. If you have Jewish friends, they are part of this ethnic lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So in that mix is Joseph. Now Joseph, remember, he was shipped off, he was trafficked, he went to Egypt as a slave, he rose to power, and he is favored by Pharaoh. He's second in command. And so when Pharaoh hears that Joseph's family has come looking for food, Pharaoh, who loves Joseph so much, he says, you got to help them out. you got to take care of your family. And so this Pharaoh offers to Joseph saying, hey, there's this nice piece of land, this nice area, this nice real estate called Goshen. Why don't you bring your family and settle them there and they can build a life there? And so Joseph receives this land of Goshen, which is basically a little area within Egypt, and they build their family. They continue to grow. They continue to expand as the nation of Israel within Egypt. So in the book of Exodus, right away, it's fast-forwarding things. So by the time we get to verse 6 in chapter 1, it's recording that Everybody, Joseph and everybody in that first generation has now died. So he's like, fast forward the tape. And so we're getting to this point now. Everyone in that original generation that moved in has died. Now the Israelites have multiplied. They've become an entire huge group of people and nation. And as time has passed on, Pharaoh has also died And now there's a new pharaoh in town. There's someone else ruling. And this pharaoh, who's Joseph? What? What did you do for those people? And so this pharaoh has a very different outlook on these Israelite people who are in his land. So what does this pharaoh do? We cannot have this. We cannot have all these refugee people coming into our country, so he enslaves them in verse 7 to 14 of chapter 1. We just look at verse 8 and 11. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. So he's worried that there's going to be an uprising because there's too many of them. And then verse 11 Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They enslaved them. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses. They're probably building the highways and the roads. They're doing all the hard labor. So this family of 70 people that came through Joseph has now grown into this mass population. Remember, back in Genesis, when God promised Abraham that his descendants would be more numerous than all the stars he could see in the sky, this promise is being fulfilled. Some historical scholars estimate that the Israeli population by this time may be in the two to three million range. So imagine, one, Abraham, 70 who moved into Egypt, now two to three million No wonder it says that the land was filled with them and this new pharaoh feels threatened because they are too many and too mighty. So this king, this pharaoh, has concerns about these Jews and he's thinking, I got to do something or they're going to take over and Egypt was the superpower of the world at the time, so I'm just going to enslave all of them. So he oppresses them. More they multiply, more he oppresses them. But you know what happens? They keep growing. They keep multiplying because that's what God promised. And so this Pharaoh is more and more upset, more and more threatened by them. And so the next step is then we're going to start killing them off. Genocide of the Jews starts to take place. You look at verse 16, it says, When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women, it's Hebrew women who are giving birth, you see them on the birth stool. They're about to give birth. If it is a son, then immediately you're going to kill that boy. If it's a daughter, then let, let her live. 
Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast in the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now, slavery didn't do the job for Pharaoh to put down the Israelites, to bring them under control. So Pharaoh now will resort to the systemic genocide by having every baby boy immediately killed upon birth. Can you imagine this scene? As soon as a baby is born, if it's a boy, immediately they're going to kill that baby somehow. Now, these are Hebrew midwives who are doing this. And so they're God-fearing. These are their own people. And so they do not want to do this. And so what do they start to do? They start to make up this lie saying that, you know what? We go there to help deliver the baby. We turn around to get water. These Hebrew women are strong, like, Boop, the baby comes out and they're gone. I don't know what happened. And they start to make up these stories to lie and to get out of having to do that. But Pharaoh is infuriated. So he intensifies the genocide in verse 22. So he says, it isn't just baby boys, but any Hebrew boy, even if he's older, any Hebrew is to be killed by throwing him into the Nile River. And so we can see the intensity of this genocide. They're trying to exterminate these people. But what we see then is the providence of God at work. When we look at chapter 2, verse 2 of Exodus, there's a, a woman who conceives, and she bears a son. And she saw that he was a fine child, and she hid him for three months. There was a man and this woman who are both from the tribe of Levi, one of the sons of Joseph. Remember, these Levites are sort of the priestly tribe of Israel. And so their son Moses, remember, priestly tribe. Moses is going to be like a priest. They act in priestly ways as mediator between God and men. That's what priests do. So this woman has done her best to hide her baby for three months. But she can't do it any longer. It's, it's too hard, and they're going to find out, and the baby's crying. And so the risk becomes so great that she's got to do something. Now, while other children and other boys are being killed and dumped into the Nile River, what she does is she also puts her son in the Nile River, but she puts her son in a basket. Kind of reminds you of, like, the ark that Noah was in. So he is set down in the Nile River in hopes that the river would carry him forth and God would take care of him providentially for the good. And so this woman has an older daughter, Moses' sister, who is watching carefully as all of this is happening. And she follows the basket down the river. And so as the baby floats down the river, guess who picks up that basket? We all know, right? It's the daughter of Pharaoh. She finds this basket. She picks it up, and she falls in love with this beautiful baby. And she wants this baby for herself, but she's the daughter of Pharaoh who's trying to exterminate the Jews. She cannot bring a Jewish baby into the palace. And so she's at odds because she doesn't know what to do. She wants to keep the baby so badly. And so Moses' sister, who is watching all of this, she runs up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, um, I can help you. I can find a Hebrew woman to raise this child for you. It's your child, but I'll find a Hebrew woman to raise the child for you. Okay? And then Pharaoh's daughter agrees and gives her the baby. And then who does she get? She gets a Hebrew woman who happens to be the baby's actual biological mother. And so Moses is raised by his own mother with the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. This is an amazing thing as we see the providence of God <clears throat> working. Sometimes life goes through crazy things, and sometimes we don't understand what's happening in our life, but... If we look back, sometimes we can see God's providence controlling and orchestrating things for our good. And we need to see that in our life. God's providence means he's involved in our life. He's working out the affairs of everything to help plan his purpose, even through our real choices and actions. 
And then we fast forward now. Moses is a baby. Fast forward, now he's going to grow up. And then we see chapter 2, verse 11 to 22 in that section. But we'll just look at verse 13. He's become a man. Now, when he went out the next day as a man, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? Why are you beating him up? And the man answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was suddenly afraid because not long before this, he had unintentionally and accidentally killed an Egyptian, but for fear, he hid the body, thinking that nobody had seen. So his actions here catch up with him. And it seems like everybody kind of knows what Moses did, killing an Egyptian. And now he's fearful because if Pharaoh finds out that he's killed an Egyptian, he and his family are going to be in grave danger. And so now what he's got to do is he's got to flee. Because Pharaoh's going to find out, come after him, come after his family. So he starts running as a fugitive because of what he's done. And what happens? He ends up in the land of Midian, where he marries a Midian woman and begins a new life there outside of the context of his family and outside the land of Goshen, outside the land of Egypt. He is on the run and he lives there for the next 40 years where God prepares him for the future work. Now, through all of this, what's going on? These Israelite people, they are still suffering. They are still enslaved. They are still being oppressed. But God is remembering his covenant. In verse 23 of chapter 2 of Exodus, it says, During those many days, that king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, meaning God heard their cries. He heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God never forgot his promises, but God is letting these things play out in redemptive history. But God never forgot those promises, and he's remembering it again, the promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, those patriarchs in Genesis. So after 40 years, the Pharaoh of Egypt dies And now it sets the stage. Remember, that Pharaoh is going to be mad because Moses killed an Egyptian. So now after 40 years, that Pharaoh has passed away. So now Moses can come back because that Pharaoh is no longer in power. So it's during this time that the oppression of Israel grew too much for them to bear. I mean, they're not just servants. They're slaves, beaten slaves. And so God hears their groaning. It's become too much. And so God, who knows their pain, God calls to Moses at the burning bush and says, you are going to be the deliverer of Israel. You are going to lead my people out of Egypt. You are going to bring them towards freedom to the promised land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying, now it is time for that promise to be fulfilled. You lead them out of Egypt. You lead them into the promised land. That time has come. That time is now. And so through a series of miraculous events, 10 plagues, different things, finally Pharaoh gives up and he lets the people go. And they leave Egypt. Pharaoh tries once more. He pursues them. They get to the Red Sea. It's a dead end, but God parts the Red Sea so they can pass through. And all of the Egyptians are drowned in the Red Sea in God's judgment. And the people are free. But what happens is they're faithless. They're disobedient. And so God is going to send them on a journey for 40 years wandering in circles. It's not a straight line journey. It's like 40 hours of driving around Wisconsin. Can you imagine that? 40 years they're journeying around, walking around until that first generation is going to pass away. So as we think about the patriarchs of Genesis, the progression of Israel as a nation in Exodus, and we see Moses now 
became the deliverer, and he will now lead them for these 40 years around the wilderness. They're learning to trust in God. Their hearts are being purified. They're learning to depend on God every day for the manna that he provides. They're learning to love him. They're learning to hear his word. They're learning to hear God's voice. And finally now, after 40 years, it's time. It's time to enter the promised land. After 40 years, the original people who heard that promise, they're not even alive anymore. It's the children of those people who are going to experience the fulfillment. And so this is the preparation now, the rise of Joshua. Three verses we read this morning. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, I want us to remember this phrase, the servant of the Lord, Joshua, He is not called the servant of the Lord until the end of the book, the end of his ministry. We'll talk about that later on. Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, into the land that I am giving to them. Make sure we see those words. I am giving to them. To the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. So Joshua, as we get ready to study this book, is an important figure in the Old Testament. He actually has the same name as Jesus. Jesus and Joshua is actually the same name. Just as Joshua of the Old Testament will lead the people of God into the promised land, we too will be led by our Joshua, Jesus, into the spiritual promised land that we're waiting for and that we're wandering around, wandering around waiting to get into someday. So many of the lessons that we see unfolding in Israel's history are lessons that will be relevant to our own lives and our own story as God's people on a spiritual journey as well towards our spiritual promised land. And so there's much to learn from the book of Joshua and what they go through. Just We're going to talk about outline of the book of Joshua and then just five quick lessons. Quick outline of the book of Joshua, just so we have a frame of reference. We'll come back to this. We'll see how in the first five chapters, they enter into the promised land. This is them getting into that promised land as Joshua leads them. And then what happens is, chapter 6 to 12, it's bloody. It's fighting battles. There's war. We'll talk about those kinds of things. They're taking possession of the land. They're killing many people to take possession of this land. They're driving out the inhabitants, the Canaanites who are living in that land. And then chapter 13 to 21, we're not going to probably talk about this too much because it's just a process of distributing the promised land to the different tribes. And then at the very end, they serve God in this promised land. This amazing story. So what I want to end with is just as we finish this, Third point, just five lessons to learn from the book of Joshua. Just things that I I think about. These are five of many lessons that we'll learn from the book of Joshua, but just five that I thought about that I I really latched on to. Number one is God's faithfulness to his promises. Israel's entrance into the land is a fulfillment of God's promises that go all the way back to Abraham, Abraham, It's actually a fulfillment of God's promises that go all the way back to Adam in some ways, where God promised that a Messiah would come, and the Messiah is going to come through this nation of Israel. And that way, God is being faithful to his promises that go all the way back to Adam. We can always bank on the promises of God in our life. He is faithful. What he has promised in our life, promised to be with us, promised to watch over us, promised to not let our foot slip, he will be faithful. You may spill your coffee, but you will not spill your life. He will be faithful, okay? Second lesson I thought of, we'll see how God can save anyone. Even though the book of Joshua is about the chosen nation of Israel, 
we will see glimpses that God's plan includes all of humanity and all of mankind. We'll see, for example, through the story of Rahab the prostitute, that God uses Israel in the beginning, but his eventual plan is to include all the nations of the earth, just as he promised. And so God can save anyone, even as we see someone like Rahab the prostitute having faith and showing her faith in this God. So we'll see that we are not saved by our race, but we are saved simply by his grace. God can save anyone. God can save anyone around us in your workplace. God can save anyone in your family. There's no one outside of his grace who we cannot save. Third lesson that we'll learn is God can make a way. Israel faced, when they came to the Red Sea with the Egyptians pursuing them, it seemed like they were at a dead end, literally. But it was God who made a way through the Red Sea as he parted it so that they could cross. In the same way, we're going to see Israel come to dead ends as they enter and take possession of the promised land. It's going to seem like they come to this roadblock where they're not going to make it any further and it's going to be the end of them. But it is God who will make a way for them. Whenever we also face what seems like dead ends in our life, it is always as we journey with God that he somehow makes a way for us to go through and get to the other side. Sometimes those roadblocks and dead ends that you face in your life, they are great blessings because it is a chance for us to see the hand of God make a way and open up avenues and open up doors that we could not on our own. God can make a way, and we see that in this book of Joshua. Fourth lesson, God gives second chances. Israel was blessed to be the chosen nation that God was going to use up. They were blessed to be set free from slavery in Egypt. But just as they complained in the wilderness with Moses, they will complain, they will be fearful, they will be unfaithful to God even as they enter the new promised land that he is giving to them. They will forget to trust God just like we often do. They will become self-dependent and it will lead to their own devastation. They will not trust in God like they trusted when they overcame Jericho and they come to the next city of Ai and they get defeated. Why? Because they tried to do it with their own hands instead of doing it with their hearts and faith. But God, even though they are devastated for a while, God gives them a second chance. And our whole life is really a second chance in Christ. No matter how much we fail, no matter how much we forget God, He never gives up on us, and there's always second chance as long as we're on this side of heaven. Last but not least, God always overcomes. God always overcomes. This book of Joshua, it is a bloody book. It is, it's it's going to be like a rated R movie at times, but God's people, they not only have to enter the land, but they have to take possession of it because there's people living there. There's people who do not want them to come in, and they're going to have to fight and battle. The Canaanites must be driven out in order for them to take possession of this promised land that is theirs. And so we'll see that despite whatever enemies God's people face, it's God who is fighting And all we need to do is follow and be on God's side. We'll see, whenever we align our life with God, we experience victory because God always overcomes. If you're with God, we will always overcome with him. So we talked about patriarchs of Genesis, seeing the flow of history till now. We talked about the story of Israel, progression of how they grew and became a nation, how they were enslaved, how they became free. And then now, after all that wandering in the wilderness, they are right outside of the promised land. They are right outside, and they're about to enter in, and this is where the book of Joshua is going to pick up. Let me just share a couple, one more thing. I felt convicted to study Joshua because I think this book can help to guide us, speak to us, maybe even rebuke us, 
during this season that we're in of multiplication. Uh, multiplication is going to take place as many new people come to Madison for school and jobs in the next few weeks. Multiplication is going to take place as we move to having two Sunday service locations in just three weeks, in just three weeks. So I just want to end with this final thought from Joshua chapter 5, which convicts me a lot. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15, when Joshua was by Jericho, right before they're going to face that first major battle, He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, neither. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Look at Joshua. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to this servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua, when he has this vision and sees this commander of the army of the Lord, this is a theophany. It's an appearance of God himself to Joshua. And so Joshua's question is, hey, Are you on my side or are you on their side? Are you for me or are you against me? Like whose side are you on? Who are you fighting for? And what the answer reveals to Joshua and to us is he's asking the wrong question. Because this commander says, no, neither. I'm not on your side. I'm not on their side. The real question is, is whose side are you on, Joshua? Whose side are you on, people of God? The commander is saying, I, with my sword lifted up, I am going into the battle. And he's saying, are you with me? Are you following me? Are you going where I'm going? It's not about me going where you want me to go. It's about you going where I'm going. You following me. So the point is, it's about God Not being on our side, like it's our battle, but it's about us aligning ourselves to be on God's side and following him into the battle that he is going to win for us. And so what does Joshua do? He realizes, oh my gosh, I got it all wrong. And he falls to his face on the ground and he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? He's saying, I got all these plans. Forget it. What do you want me to do right now? I'm your servant. I will do whatever you tell me to do. Forget all the plans we made. Forget all the stuff that we, just, we wrote down. What do you want me to do? And Joshua realizes that he is simply a servant of the Lord, and he needs to be on God's side. I was thinking as we begin this new season of ministry, it's not about God being on our side or with our plans. It's not about God following us and blessing what we decide to do. But I pray that as a church, we will not be doing our own thing and saying, God, can you bless our plans here? That's what we often do. No, we want to always simply be saying, here we are. We're your servants. Tell us what to do. Lead us. Guide us. And so our prayer with our face to the ground should be, what does my Lord, what does our Lord say to his servants at HCM? What does our Lord say to his servants at HCM? Here we are, humbling ourselves before you. Lead us. Guide us. We're here to do what you want to do as you go into the battle. And so I pray that that would be the attitude that we have as we move towards the next year of our church. I'm not leading this church. The vision team is not leading this church. No one is leading this church but God alone. And all we need to do is get on our faces sometimes, lift up our hands and say, what does the Lord say to his church, to his servants? We're here to do your will, to follow your plan to follow you into whatever battles you face because we want to be on your side, God. And so 
May that be our prayer as we move forward together. Let's pray.